Amen, amen, amen. Um, So we're gonna go to Acts chapter two. We're at the end of the chapter. So if you got your Bibles, get your Bibles out. If you got a Bible app, get that fired up. If you're taking notes, everybody should take notes. Uh, Get that fired up as well. So we're in Acts chapter two. And let me just set this up. We're gonna start in verse 22 here in a second. But let me... Let me set this up. If you were here with us the last few weeks, you know that Luke is the author of the book of Acts. He likes to give us a lot of detail. Amen. Time-wise, or location-wise, we're in Jerusalem. Time-wise, this is 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. And so if you know the story of Jesus in the Gospels, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Three days later on Sunday, he rises from the dead. He appears to his disciples and he's with them for 40 days. Now, you don't have to remember, there will be no quiz later on on all these days. But I just want you to get you uh, to have a sense of how uh, quick all of this is. Because it's 40 days after that, he spends with the disciples teaching them spending time with them, um, seeing them face to face. In 1 Corinthians, it says, in one of those moments, over 500 believers saw Jesus all at once. Um, And so they knew that the miracle had taken place. Do you know anybody that's risen from the dead? No, you don't. This is unique. It's a massive moment, right? And so that massive moment happens for them and it happens in Jerusalem and you just cannot even imagine how electric the air is. You've had moments in your life where an event happened, maybe the birth of a child, maybe, maybe your marriage, maybe something like 9-11. And as soon as that moment happened, while you were going through it, you knew my life will never be the same, ever Like from this point forward, everything's just different. When Jesus rose from the dead, those people knew everything is different now. And Jesus is appearing to them and he says, hey, wait, because the Holy Spirit's gonna come. 10 more days, they were in a prayer meeting. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit whooshed in. Do you remember that? So last week I made the sound effect. I'm not doing it this week because I wanna be kinder to the sound guy than I was last week, but he whooshes in. And when he does, he fills up. There's 120 of them to start. 120 Christians, they all get a little tongue or a flame of fire above their head to signify that they were being filled with God. They were being filled with his supernatural power. They were being filled with the closeness of God with them, his presence with them. It's this amazing moment. And then they start to speak in other languages. Why are they speaking in other languages? Because they're in the middle of this massive Jewish festival called Pentecost. And all these people from other countries and from all over Israel, they've all come to Jerusalem together. So Jerusalem is just jammed with all these people because it's this massive festival and everybody's taking pilgrimage back to the temple and they're gonna worship Yahweh and all this kind of stuff. They don't expect all this Jesus stuff is gonna be happening, but it does and the miracle, and they start to speak all these other languages, and all these people who spoke all these other languages are hearing their native language being spoken to them, praising God. They know it's a miracle, and they start to surround these 120 Christians. And when they surround them, Peter starts to speak. He starts to preach his first bold sermon. And even that is a miracle, Because Peter, if you know, he's the guy who denied Jesus three times because he didn't want to stand up for Jesus when things got tough. Well, now Peter's filled with the spirit and it's going to come out in massive boldness. So listen to his voice. This is verse 22. People of Israel, listen. So this is the thousands of people that have gathered around because they're seeing this miracle happen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. How do they know? They had all seen it, especially the people throughout Israel. Every time Jesus had come to a new town, people flocked to him, right? He was a megastar. He was a celebrity, a guy who does miracles, a guy that heals people. And even the way he taught in his parables, He taught like no one else they had ever heard before, right? And so Jesus had a name. Jesus had a reputation, massive one already. So Peter's like, you all know all about Jesus already. Verse 23, but God knew what would happen and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. He's talking about the cross here. And with the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. 
So Peter looks out at all these Jewish people and he says, yes, Jewish people like the Romans and Pilate, they're, they're the ones who physically nailed him to the cross, but you did it. You're the ones who accused him. You're the ones who wanted to be rid of him. You're the ones who rejected God's Messiah. And it's just like, this is not a seeker sensitive moment. Right? Like, come on, Peter, be nicer to people, right? Mm -mm. He's right in their face. He's had it with that old seeker sensitive stuff, right? Like he's ready to be bold. Even if they throw me in chains, I'm ready to be bold about it. I love that about him in this moment. He might even go too far. I don't know, but he's definitely being led by God here because all these people are going to find Jesus. It's amazing. Now, I'm not going to give you the whole sermon that Peter preaches here because next week Peter's going to preach again and Pastor Ricky's going to preach on that one and he's going to go in depth on that particular sermon in chapter three. But I'll just give you this, verse 40. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strong, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Pause right there. He continued preaching for a long time. Long sermons are the best sermons, amen? Amen. It took you a second, second service. Come on. Gosh. I mean, that's underlined like triple in my Bible. Um, amazing. Uh, the other thing though going on there is Luke, Dr. Luke is telling us, I'm not giving you the whole Peter sermon here. I'm just summarizing it in chapter two because he went on for a long time and this would have been a whole lot more pages. So Luke wants you to know he's not giving you every single word that Peter preached. He's a historian. He wants you to know that. And then verse 41, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. In a moment, it's a mega church. That's the power of that day. In a moment, it's a mega church. 3,000 people. You started with 120 believers that were left, and now it's 3,000. It's crazy. And how in the world were they baptized? There's no river right there. They're all there in the temple complex, most likely. How in the world were they baptized? Um, it's just a, it, it, again, if you're taking notes and you're, your brain just needs to figure this out, um, the short answer is I don't know how they all got baptized. But my guess is this, ba based on just a little bit of research, um, they had all around the temple complex, these uh, little washing stations called mikvahs. Say mikvah. Mikvah. And if you see a picture of it, they've, they've uncovered about 200, maybe a little over 200 of these. Uh, archaeologists, have, you can actually go and visit them in the Holy Land today. But there's so much in the Old Testament law about you had to get yourself ceremonially, ceremonially washed and cleaned for worship before you went into the temple, that they would have these little stations where you would walk down some stone steps into a pool and you could wash yourself like a public bath. And then you could go the rest of the way into the temple and you could worship because now you were clean. Now, we don't need necessarily the physical water to be clean spiritually, right? Because Jesus has cleansed us. But they were baptized, all 3,000 of them. My guess is they took advantage of those mikvahs. We'll see. Acts 4, uh, 2.42. All the believers, this is all 3,000 of them, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. So this is, this is a new church just got born. This is crazy. And, and, and look at all of the things that they're doing together. Like they're, they're hanging on every word that the apostles tell them because the apostles were the ones who actually knew Jesus. So it's like, here's everything that he taught. Here's all his parables. Here's all the miracles. Let us teach you everything. Let us disciple and mentor you to become Christians. They're doing that in mass. They're also sharing meals and they're doing fellowship together. They're hanging out, studying God's word together, leaning on each other for prayer requests and needs and, and, and they're praying together. This is, you gotta stop and, and remember who these people are for just a second. These are people who traveled into Jerusalem to go to a festival. They only took enough clothes, enough money, 
enough resources to go in, go to the festival and go back home. They didn't expect when we go to the festival, our entire spiritual life is gonna be turned upside down. So when they got there and then they're in the midst of this, this is just wild. Have you ever gone to a Christian conference before? Or maybe a Christian camp before? And you get so fired up at the end that you don't wanna go home. These guys didn't go home. It's wild. But they stuck there because they realized this is so massively different. We're a part of this now. And again, we see it through this kind of modern lens and it confuses us because for us, being a Christian is just one of many attributes for our identity, right? Like I'm all of these things and I'm a Christian. I'm all of these things and this is my whole life. And I just kind of pour a little bit of Christianity in. And, and when it's that way, I get it. But for these people, the whole world had just changed and they were a part of it. And they're looking around at their jobs and their houses and their possessions and everything. And they're like, none of it matters anymore. God is here and we're going to be a part of it. That's the kind of revolutionary stuff these people were going through. Does that make sense now? And so this is all the stuff that they're doing together. This is how the early church was. So verse 44, and all the believers met together in one place and they shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in needs because they didn't have jobs in Jerusalem yet. They didn't have places to stay. They didn't have all the stuff that they needed. So some of the wealthier ones started selling some of the stuff, giving the money to the apostles, and then they're spreading it out and sharing it so that everybody can be okay. I mean, it was wild, okay? This is like a little commune. Verse 46, they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So this is 3,000 people together. And it says that somehow they were all gathered in the temple as a collective. Now the temple could hold thousands and thousands of people, but this particular group of 3000 people would have been their own collective and they're meeting in the Jewish temple. Why? Because they don't see themselves as a new religion. They're Jews and they're continuing as far as they're concerned in their Jewishness. They just found the Messiah right now. Does that make sense? So because that's how they see it in those days, they just walk right into the Jewish temple. It's like, this is for us. And they use it as their church building. And they're, they're meeting there and they're hearing the apostles teach. They're also in homes for the Lord's Supper. What's that all about? How do you take the communion meal with 3,000 people? You don't. At least not in those days, right? So they had to break the large church up into chunks and they met in homes. Homes is a context where you can actually get to know people. Have you ever been to a really large church before and you felt like a number there? Some of you guys have had that experience. It's always hard to take a large church and make it feel small. And when I say make it feel small, I mean make it feel like you have actual life together and community with a small collective of people. So they figured out how to do that. And I would love to know who the manager slash organizer person was who put all of that together. Cause I pity them, right? <laughs> like we've got to get all these people into homes. Who's got a home? You know, you can hold 15, you can hold 10, you can hold 20. And they'd come together and they would do the Lord's supper together. But you can bet also that group of people, those are the ones that they knew. We know their prayer requests. We know what's going on in their marriage. We're lifting them up and trying to carry each other's burdens in this small context because I can't know 3,000 people. So anyway, the church figured that out. They're also praising God. They're sharing their meals with great joy. They have the goodwill of all the people. That's every, everybody outside the church. They've got a good reputation with people outside the church. And there's a steady trickle of people getting saved, which I love. Now, this next picture I'm going to give you, this is a, this is a, model that was created of the old temple 
Um, now, the old temple, Herod's temple, it's called, it was originally built by Solomon, and then that one got destroyed. And then Herod, at the time of Jesus, he rebuilt the temple. This one uh, that you see here, uh, this was destroyed in AD 70 by uh, the emperor Titus of Rome. Uh, so he destroyed it. That's why you can't go to it today. There's only one remaining wall called the Wailing Wall that you can go and you can go see. So this is a model that was just created to show you what it might have looked like. It's this massive thing. Now, some of you are bored already, but I geek out on this kind of stuff, okay? Um, so if it's boring, I'm sorry. But that center spot there, that's a lot of that is, is, is kind of what you imagine in the old tabernacle with, with like the Holy of Holies and, and the holy place and all the, the items of furniture and the Ark of the Covenant and the bronze altar and all that kind of stuff. It's all in that center section. And then you've got the wider court, right? Court of the Gentiles, right? Like, like you don't even have to be born as a Jew, but you can go in there if you're a worshiper of Yahweh. And that's got to hold massive amounts of people. And then on the corners of it, it's not just walls, even though it might look that way here. But do you see the pillars that are there, the columns? Those are colonnades. They call them porches or porticos. Okay, and what, what, what you would have is you would have this inner court where everything's wide open, and then you'd have two layers of columns, and then you'd have space underneath this roof before you hit the outside wall. And so if it was rainy, you could go underneath there. Scholars also think that if you wanted to hear someone preaching or teaching to a large group of people, you would go underneath those spaces because the acoustics were better. So several times in the book of Acts, one of the things that you're going to see is it's going to refer to what the early apostles were doing. And it's going to say they were at Solomon's porch or Solomon's colonnade when they did this. That's the bottom portico. It's right there. 3,000 people in the temple all at the same time. Next verse, Acts 2.46. Actually, I'm going back. We already read this part, but I just want to pull something out. It says that they worshiped together at the temple each day, probably at Solomon's portico. And they met in homes for the Lord's Supper. Now, that just says together, which doesn't make it, make it seem like a very big deal. Some of your translations, though, say they were of one accord in the temple. And that's because the actual word, and I'm going to try to pronounce it, I'm going to fail here at this, is homothymodon. Homothymodon, right? Um, it means to be of one accord or mind. It means that when they were meeting together in the temple, what Dr. Luke thinks is the important point for you to understand is that they were unified. They had the same heart. They had the same mind as they were together. They weren't fighting. They weren't bickering. They weren't divisive. They all had the same purpose. They all had the same Lord. The, the, the air was full of energy. They were all passionate. They knew what they were about. Does that make sense? They were of one accord. And, and this, this uh, word right here shows up 10 times in the book of Acts. This is a hallmark of the early church. Verse four, uh, chapter four, verse 32. And then all the believers were united in heart and mind. So this is jumping to chapter four. And they felt that they, what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything that they had. Again, that's two chapters later, just showing you that they were not bickering and fighting because the bickering and fighting comes later. It definitely comes. Because some of you are wondering, well, then how did we get here? <clears throat> Before we talk about how we got here, you have to just take a moment and realize what they were experiencing then. This is what I would call the honeymoon phase of the church. They had just been born. They're absolutely passionate and excited and they're seeing miracles happen. They're giving up everything in their life. They're spending all this time together. They know what they're about. And they haven't even considered what's going to divide them in the future. And it's the honeymoon phase. Have you ever experienced that? Some of you guys that have been married, have you ever experienced the honeymoon phase? When you're naked all the time? God, I was looking for a bigger reaction from that. <laughs> just, just get it all out. Take a drink. 
there's this beautiful thing that happens when a relationship comes together and you're crazy in love, you can't get enough of each other, you wanna do everything together, every evening is a date, right? Like you just, you're talking through everything, you just can't get enough. Like that's the way it's supposed to go. And it happens for a while and then you start, gotta start working at it, right? And, and I get that, and that's not, that's not bad. But this in love thing that happens at the beginning, you don't have to work at it. That's the important part. I heard one, t- one uh, uh, kind of marriage counselor t- kind of person talk about it. And he's like, it's like God pours this glue from heaven on this young guy and young gal. And anything that would even want to pull them apart, they just <laughs> keep sticking together. And they don't have to work at it. And it's wonderful. It's beautiful. It's great. And we all kind of miss it. Yes. But it's like, why, why do we have that? Well, because later on, it is going to be work. And we need to look back and remember that it was possible. Amen? Come on. We need to look back and remember that it was possible. We need to look back and remember that it was good. We need to look back and remember that if we work, we can get back to that. Because here's the goal. It's not to have had a honeymoon phase. It is to be in love with your spouse for the rest of your life. That's what we're going for. And so the early church, they have this honeymoon phase and they give up everything and they're meeting together all the time and everything's good and everything's easy and there's no arguments and it's beautiful and it's gorgeous. Why? Because the church in the future needs to know. We need to look back and know this was possible and we need to get back there. Yes. And it may be some work and it's okay, but look how beautiful it is. Yes? They are at their most pure, their most innocent, filled with power, passion, and love. This is early unity in the church. I want you to know, too, just briefly, that um, this early unity, this one accordness that they had, this is something that Jesus had prayed for for them. So this is the answer to a prayer, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. So we're going to go to John 17, verse 20. Um, And this high priestly prayer of Jesus, it's called that because Jesus is about to go to the cross and just give you a tiny bit of context for it. The last supper has already happened. He's not yet arrested and he goes off kind of by himself and he has this moment of prayer and, and John records the entire prayer. And so he starts and he's talking to God the Father. And he's talking about what he's done. He's, he's praying for his 12 disciples. How, how many of you know that if Jesus prays for you, that's a big deal? Amen. Right? Like Jesus prayed for you. And so he's praying for the disciples. And then he changes and he starts praying for every church member that would ever come in the future. So this is verse 20. He says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message, that's us for every generation that came after them. Verse 21, he says, I pray that they will be one just as you and I, Father, are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. What does he pray for? He prays that we'd be unified. So he saw acts coming, yes? Yes? He saw it coming. He wanted it. He prayed for it. It's a huge moment. But also, look at the little formula that he gives because this formula is probably the most massive thing in this whole sermon. So don't miss this. If you're asleep, you need to wake up right now, at least for a minute. This formula is huge. He says, I want them to be unified because if they'll be unified, then the world will know. If they're unified, then the world will know, Father, that you sent me. He's going to say it again as well. Verse 22, I've given them the glory that you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Amen. So what's he saying in this prayer? He's saying, listen, there are people that believe in me right now that believe in Jesus, but there's the whole rest of the world that doesn't get it yet. And I want them to get it. What's John 3, 16? For God so loved the world 
He didn't want to abandon them. He didn't want to leave them on their own. For God so loved the world that he sent his only uh, begotten son, right? That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm saying it in old translation, but he wanted the world to know. He said, the way that the world is going to know is if my people have perfect unity. That's the formula. Amen. Crazy. Because what would we expect that the leader of our movement would want to pray for as he builds his church for the very first time? I would have expected him to pray for uh, inspiring, beautiful cathedrals, Lord, that they would build. I pray for amazing preachers and book authors that will influence the masses. God, I pray for a great worship band to get them all pumped and fired up. Come on. Wouldn't he have prayed for those things? Um, that he would have prayed for amazing miracles to happen so that people cannot deny the supernatural nature of his church or that his church would have perfect doctrine and teaching. He doesn't pray for that. He prays for unity. He says, if they can get along, if they can love each other, if they can respect each other, if they can work through their differences, if they could not bicker, if they could face division and find unity somehow, then the world will know. Are we known for our unity or are we known for our division? He wanted unity, prayed for it. And he says, I want them to be one as we're one. So I got to define that just really quick. What does he mean there? So he's looking at the father and he's saying, father, and he's talking about the Trinity. He's like, father, son, and Holy Spirit, we're one. And we love each other. We're unified and like-minded, one heart, one mind. We've got this down. They need to have it like we do. <clears throat> so how do they have it? Short answer is I don't know, but I'll try. At the baptism of Jesus, do you remember that scene? Jesus goes to get baptized. He's the son of God and he has never sinned before. He doesn't need to get baptized. But God the father tells him to get baptized so he can fulfill all righteousness. And so he goes to John and says, you better dunk me. John the Baptist goes and dunks him. The son, that's number one, the son obeys the father by being baptized. That's part one. Then the father, you remember what he does? In that same scene, the father speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Yes? yes? So the father affirms and loves and does it publicly and loudly. And then what does the Holy Spirit do? He takes the form of a dove and he comes down and descends on Jesus. Even John the Baptist later on said he saw the spirit descend as a dove onto Jesus. And that's how he knew he was the Messiah. So here's what you've got. <clears throat> You've got in the Trinity, three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're all in different places. They're all doing different things with their personalities, by the way. And they come together in unity. See, unity assumes um, differences. Unity is not sameness. Unity is not oversimplification. Um, unity assumes that things are different and distinct and unique and we have to unify them together. Amen. The church is not the Borg for you Star Trek fans. We must assimilate you. Oh gosh, that was just failed miserably. Um, anyway, <clears throat> the point of the church <clears throat> is not to so train you that we drive out all the differences from all of you. It assumes the differences, celebrates the differences, and say the job is to come together and be unified just the same way <clears throat> that the Trinity is. And if we experience that kind of unity, then the world will know. So that's easy. Let's pray. Just be unified, right? No. Super tough. Uh, it's, it's hard. Unity is hard. It's so hard that look at this quick list from the book of Acts. <clears throat> So I told you in Acts chapter four, they were all still unified and it was beautiful. 
keep reading tax chapter six and everything falls apart. Um, this is just the way of things, right? Um, there's this scene where they were distributing food to everybody that was in need in the early church. And they're an even bigger mega church by the time you get to chapter six. And the Jewish widows are getting all the food because most of the people who are distributing the food are Jewish leaders and they're ignoring the Hellenistic widows. So there's a little bit of racism in there. There's a little bit of us against them, even though we're all Christians in the church. And the people who loved the Hellenistic widows, they complained about it. And the very first church deacons come forward and help out because of this early problem and division. A division happened, and they found unity. Acts 9, um, Paul, if you know Paul's story, he had like murdered Christians. Um, it's a big deal. They were terrified of him. When he found Jesus, Jesus found him actually and saved him on the Damascus road. He starts showing up to the different disciples saying, I'm saved now, I'm on your side. They don't believe him. Um, and it's a real difficult thing for them to, him to get them to believe him. Acts 11, um, Peter decides to take the gospel to the Gentiles, which was a big no-no for Jewish people. They did not like that. Again, a little bit of... Uh, um, Ego and pride and racism, maybe uh, all, in, all into that. And they criticize Peter for taking it to the Gentiles, but God blesses it. And they have to work through that together. Uh, the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. And then also in Acts 15, some of you guys know the story. Paul and Barnabas, who were this wonderful pair of missionaries in the early church, planted all of these churches. They had a rift between them and they had to separate as missionaries and they had to go their separate ways. And it's this real heartbreak that happens in the book of Acts because they can't work it out. And then we get evidence later on that they worked it out. But here's the point. Unity is a struggle. This is not easy stuff. So how do we do it? Here's, here's one truth you need to know. Ephesians 4.1. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Amen. So we're called to it. Jesus prayed for it. The early church had it. And we're called to it. Binding yourselves together with peace, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. So the, the big thing he says, comes and says here is, I don't care how many denominations you've got, there's only one church. Amen. I don't care your different opinions about God, there's only one God. There's one Father, there's one Jesus, there's one Holy Spirit, there's one faith, there's one baptism. You're like, why is there one baptism? Um, you go over into like 1 Corinthians and Paul's talking to people about baptisms. He's like, you were baptized by this person. You were baptized by this person. You are baptized by this person. You think you're better because you got baptized by this pastor. Like we're of this pastor, we're of this pastor, we're of this pastor. And Paul comes in and says, how about you're all just baptized into Jesus? And I'm of Jesus. <coughs> I had a friend at work and he had a church and he's like, you ought to come to my church. And I'm like, cool, I'll come visit your church. And he's like, if you do, you're going to have to get baptized by me in my church because you can't be part of my church unless you've gotten baptized by me into my church. And I'm like, then I'm not coming to your church. No, no offense. I don't mean any offense to you, but I'm not going to get baptized by you as if my baptism into Jesus isn't what mattered because that's what mattered is one baptism is what he says. And make every effort because unity is not uniformity and it's not sameness. Unity is based on the idea of diversity, but we've all got one Lord. There's a picture in Revelation. Some of you guys have, I'm not going to read it to you today, but I'll just give it, you a little bit of it. There's a picture in Revelation and it imagines a scene where all God's people who've ever been saved, ever been part of the church, they all gather around the throne. And it's this gorgeous picture and, and they're all praising God. But what's amazing about it is he describes that it's, it's people from every single nation, every single language, every single race, every single gender, every single skin color. And they're all there worshiping God together. But they're in white robes. Why are they in white robes? Because that's the blood of Jesus Christ that has washed their sins away. So what makes them one is Jesus and they haven't given up their distinctives. Revelation is celebrating their differences. 
but they've all come together under the banner of Jesus Christ. When you go to heaven, you do not give up your skin color. Not according to that passage. But you got a white robe on because you belong to him. And that's what unifies us. What if there's actually old people around the throne and young people? What then? What if there's conservatives and liberals around the throne of God, all in white robes? What if there's Calvinists and Arminians all in white robes around the throne of God? What if there's Baptists and Charismatics all together around God's throne in white robes? What if there's Catholics and Lutherans in white robes around the throne of God? What if? Just one body, one spirit, one glorious hope, one faith, one baptism, one Father of all. 40,000 denominations today. That's true. One faith, though. So how do you do unity? The short answer is I don't know, but I'm going to try. And this next section of the message is going to be the least satisfying part of the entire message. I'm just going to warn you about that. Because I can't really give a big seminar on how to do unity right now. Because on some level... It's kind of like saying, fix me, doctor, even though I don't know what's broken. And it's a thousand different things that could be broken. Yes? So how do you do unity? I'm just going to really, really simplify it for you into two really basic steps and see how we do. And then as we see the early church in the coming weeks, as we keep studying Acts, as we see them struggle to reunify them when the challenges come, we're going to dive into their strategies. But for now, super, super basic. Practical step number one is choose now to be stuck. Choose now to be stuck. Okay, so you're talking to a new couple and they're about to get married. One of the top things we'll tell them is you got to choose now to never get divorced. Don't choose then because you won't choose (laughs) Right? Choose now to never even say the word divorce in the middle of a fight, ever. It doesn't ever come up. Don't, don't ever pull that lever with the other person, right? Because that's a massive threat to the other person. Here's the thing. You can't decide in the middle of the worst fight you've ever had to say, we shouldn't say divorce. It doesn't work then. Everybody's passions and anger is way too high. Make the decision way back here when everything's chill and that glue's poured all over you, right? And you're in love. Make the decision then, because it helps, yes? Same thing in your extended family. You're gonna get together for um, Thanksgiving, and everybody's gonna be gathered around the table, and there's gonna be some differences that are gonna pop up. I can't believe he did that. I can't believe she believes that. I can't believe they said this at the table. Let's disown them. No, don't disown family. You're like, well, sometimes people do. I know. And we know when we see that, that that's something to grieve, not celebrate. People gather around that Thanksgiving table with their extended family. And guess what? Everybody gets a seat at the table. That's a healthy family. I mean, there are exceptions. There are, there are very, very extreme exceptions to that rule. But everybody gets a seat at the table. Why? Why? Because blood is bigger. Family is bigger than the things that divide you. We were all born into this. And I know we disagree on all these other things. But when we choose not to disown and we choose to stick it out, choose now to stick together, it matters. Boy, everybody got quiet on that one. Choose now to be stuck. And that's such a low bar to set, isn't it? Choose now to be stuck. For some of you, what it's stirring up is memories of like a generation or two ago when they would never consider divorce. And then you look back on grandma and grandpa and you're like, well, I guess they succeeded and never got divorced. They hated each other's guts, but they didn't get divorced. So here's the thing. Step one is a really low bar to set. It's a good bar to set because what it does is it says, hey, 
get yourself stuck in the room and don't come back out until you've worked on some things. Because if you don't have number one, you'll run for the hills every time something gets bad. So don't run for the hills, stick it out so that God can work on you. Because if you go and try to escape and run away each time, the problem is you take you with you into the next marriage, into the next relationship, into the next church. Because it's your marriage, it's your extended family, it's your church. Choose now to be stuck. Choose now to be stuck with God's people. Wait a second, our culture is every time I get mad, I just go. I know. How's that working for us? Not so great. And what did Jesus pray for? Jesus prayed we'd be one. Jesus prayed for bigger things. That should compel us, compels me. It's the most compelling thing from this whole sermon is that Jesus prayed that we'd be one. Oh, it just gets me. He said the thing that would help the world know that he had really come and that God really loves people is if we're one with perfect unity. So choose to be stuck with God's people. And then if you're going to be stuck, make it a good stuck. Don't be stuck around that Thanksgiving table and everybody's all the tension. Everybody's hating each other. Right, like that's nothing. The kind of perfect unity that will reach the world is where there's love at that table, is where people are working through their issues, right? You you see them when they're small and you decide to work on them before they become big. You choose to respect each other and learn how to communicate with each other through the differences because there's all kinds of differences and you've got to learn their language, not just keep shouting your language at them. I could take some amens this morning. This is hard stuff, right? How do we accept people who are different? It's hard work. And part of the reason it's such hard work is because our culture has taught us not to. We're meant to stay together, loving, respecting, understanding each other. Unity is not white-knuckling it to stay together. Amen. It's love. Jesus called us to love. Um, I'll say this too. Um, I mentioned it last week just to really um, make you uncomfortable. I mentioned politics last week and the fact that this is an election year and the fact that even in the church, the tension is going to go up. It's sort of okay now, but by November, we're going to feel it in this room. And there's going to be even more to divide us than to unite us. And that we would make a decision, that you would make a decision in your life now to be stuck with God's people. And not just to be stuck, but to make it a good kind of stuck. To work at those things as they emerge over the next year. Don't wait to think about this until November. It will be too late. Staying a church family is hard work. I want to confess to you that sometimes things do get to a spot, doctrinally teaching the health of the leadership, where you do need to leave a church. Linda and I have left churches before. I totally get that. Um, But often there's a path to work it out. And we need to choose that path. And as I meditated on this all this week and I'm coming to these prayer services and fasting and like spending time with God and God speaking, you know what God's been speaking to me all this week is he's been showing me times when there's been division in the church and I've been a part of it. And even in my notes, and I'm not gonna read them to you because that'd be inappropriate, but I made a list of all these names in my notes of all these people who struggled with me with division. And many of them, I made life hard on them as a pastor. I didn't want to, I didn't mean to. But as I looked back at that list of names, God could show me for every single one, this is the thing you had to learn from this person. 
This is the thing you had to walk away from and know that you had to work harder on as a pastor so that you didn't hurt the next person in the same way. Is this okay for me to share this with you? There are people in our church right now that have stuck around and they've worked with me and they've worked hard with me and a whole bunch of it's been my fault. And I don't feel condemned. I'm under the cross, I'm under the blood, I'm forgiven by Jesus. I'm just trying to be open so that you know that this stuff is real. There's people that have walked into an office with me, walked into a meeting with me and said, I love you pastor and I'm not leaving, but dot, dot, dot. I got some things to say to you. (laughs) Those aren't fun meetings, by the way. But that's the voice of a person who's fighting for unity. It's worth fighting for. And I love you guys. I love you guys for putting up with me. I love you guys for being willing to fight. Um, I think it's worth it. Last verse, Psalm 133. (laughs) It's a weird one. How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. That's weird, isn't it? Okay, here's what's going on. Just really, really fast. I know we're late. Really, really fast. Aaron was the first high priest in the Old Testament. When God instituted the priesthood, he actually gave them a special oil, a special recipe for the oil. And that's all they would ever use when they were doing ministry on somebody was use this particular oil. And he gave them the recipe to make the oil. And you're like, why do I care? Just hold on for one more second. And it had like cinnamon in it and it had myrrh in it and it had calamus, which I don't know what that is, and cassia in it and it had olive oil in it. And, and he gives the exact recipe and the exact measurements. And he's like, you put this together in this way and that makes Aaron's oil. And then he goes right on to say, he's like, and it's against the law for anybody else to make this oil. Nobody else can make this. It's only for the priests. And so what God in his brilliance created was this situation where kids are growing up in the temple and whenever they smell that oil, they know it's holiness and they know it's sacred and they know it's just God's priest doing God's work, ministering to people who are in need. And when they smell it, they smell and it's all of that. Does that make sense? And then he says, whenever people are unified, it's, it's like somebody took a bucket of this oil and dumped it on Aaron. And they didn't just put a little bit on his forehead. It's like dripping off his beard and his robe and everything. It's like, why would you do that? Because it's abundance and it's generosity and it's way more than you would ever need. Do you see what he's trying to say about unity? He's like, when the church operates in harmony, the world smells us and it's a good smell. <laughs> It's holy and it's sacred and it's love and it's overflowing generosity and it's all these things that we're supposed to be. Amen? Why don't you guys stand? Jesus, Jesus, we go back right now to that prayer that you prayed, wanting your people to be one in perfect unity so that the world could know. And Lord, I pray that we would just want that. If if you could give anything to us, Lord, as a church today, I ask that you would give us the wanting that to happen, Lord. I pray that we would want it more than we want anything else. Help us to strive after it. We love you, Jesus, in Christ's name, amen.